to this slightly shortened session on interactive teaching methods. Once again, uh, this, is, this is a topic which I believe uh, many of the speakers, my colleagues, would have handled in one fashion or the other, emphasizing the different ways of interaction and so on. So what I have tried to do is, I have tried to incorporate a few things which perhaps were not explicitly emphasized by them. Okay. To suggest what could be considered as part of the interactive teaching methods. The first and foremost in our teaching methodology are lectures. You will know that the font size that I am using to write can be seen by everyone. If you are using audio visual aids, the first and foremost is the way you prepare your slides. So in the slides, the font size and the type, and please do not assume that the same font works for all cases. The typical method that I have learned to follow is that if I am giving a talk at a new <coughs> lecture hall or a classroom which I am not familiar with and therefore I have not adapted my font, then I will prepare one slide with one font, another slide with another font and third slide with third font. And I will go to that class and I will go to the two extreme corners of that classroom. And I will see whether I can see it. If an old man can see it, younger people can usually see it well. But ability to see is very, very important. Otherwise, half the thing is lost. So in terms of, I will say, in terms of lecture slides, the font is an important parameter. The contents of the slide is another important parameter. You know, we talk of a busy slide, means just too many things in that slide. And that usually, we feel that the information is complete, but it becomes a distraction to many students. So there are some thumb rules, of course, but they vary greatly depending upon the topic that we are uh, uh, talking about. But usually, three to five sentences per slide is the best. Sometimes when you are elaborating a technical theme, then there could be lots of equations and diagrams and the slide will appear very full. That is justified, but please make sure that all your slides are not like that. Very often, and this is a mistake I made in my early years, I would write down my slides. Those days there were no over it, uh, there was no PCs and things like that. So we used to write our slides on plastic paper and, and prepare that. One advantage we found, I found at least, is that when everything is written there, then I am much better organized because I know exactly what step follows next and so on. So instead of this small piece of paper in my hand which I have to refer to, the slide itself becomes a reference. But what is convenient to me might be inconvenient to the students in the following sense, that they tend to see the entire developed theme in the slide the moment slide is projected. Whereas in the old style when I am using a blackboard, the whole theme is being developed sentence by sentence, like I am writing here. So what is coming next is not seen and therefore you are able to concentrate on the point that is being made here. Even in the slides, it is possible to have a sense of development by using, let's say, the more popular PowerPoint in the following fashion. One is, you can prepare your slides, but there is a facility in PowerPoint by which only the sentence which you are going to actually discuss will appear in bold and other things will fade away. The third one is if you want the other thing also to be kept as it is, and if you don't want to use these facilities, this I learned from my colleague Professor Anand Joshi. So what he does is suppose there is a slide with five sentences, he will actually make five slides. One with just the first sentence, second with first and second, third with first, second and third. As if you are giving an impression that you are developing it on board. 
it increases the amount of space occupied on the desk in storage of that particular slide set. But given the cost of the desk, that is not a worry at all. But it requires a little more goragiri by us. That the best way is to prepare one slide with all five sentences, copy it five times, and delete one by one the sentences. It takes hardly two minutes, but it makes much more impression. The third thing is delivery. You must always have something to deliver which is outside the slide. And the worst example, we learn from not only the best examples, but also from worst examples. There was an MTech defense here. This happened many, many years ago, again when slides used to be handwritten. And uh, this fellow had prepared huge contents on each slide. This is an entire MTech thing, very well uh, documented. But what he was doing is he will put up the slide and will read the entire slide. So of course, I mean that reading is to emphasize that after one or two slides, I mean, examiner, there was an external examiner, internal examiner, me as an another internal examiner, one chairman, and we were getting slightly bored when my colleague, Professor Sada, pointed out that, look, you need not read those slides, you know, even we can read it. So he said, okay, sir, then put up the next slide and didn't say anything for about two minutes. <laughs> And we're all wondering when he says, finish, sir. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is the worst kind of delivery that you can ever imagine from anyone. So, uh, of course, he, he, he did not realize what he was doing. He was just trying to present his case. He says, you don't want me to read, you want to read it yourself, fine, go ahead and read it. <laughs> but the purpose of teaching is not that, okay? The purpose of any delivery is to kindle the thinking process amongst the students. So, therefore, uh, the best way is to have some other uh, extreme I have seen on a beautifully delivered lecture by the Japanese president of the Creative Commons who had come here last year when we launched the Creative Commons India, who had slides, but each slide had just one word. One word, that's all. And I tell you, each of those words is edged in the memory of many people who heard that. It is like the example that I gave you of the board work. You know, independent of what you talk and what you write, but on the board what you write, if that is taken down by someone, then that acts as a refresh. The single word is a trigger, but that means the person must have taken massive efforts to identify that one word which will characterize the whole discussion for five minutes on that. Now, lectures is one thing. During the lectures, the interaction, we all know how to enforce that, you know, we'll ask some question to someone and so on. There is one problem of about the interaction during the lectures, and that problem is that the more vociferous amongst other students tend to dominate the entire interaction. So there will be few people who will still have retained that boldness to ask questions or something who will dominate that discussion. It is then our duty to ensure that during the semester that we teach, there is no student who is left alone in this interaction in the class. This is one principle I have learned to follow, that you can, you know, every day it naturally some interaction will happen. Some people will, of course, ask questions more often, and which is not bad at all. Please understand that in any interaction, suppose I am attending your class, and I, somebody else asks you a question, and you answer that somebody else. I also benefit. I am listening to that question as well as to that answer. So to that extent, it is okay. But it is important for you as a teacher to ensure that I also raise something. There are, there are three composite aspects in this. First is that you are ensuring that every person participates. Second is when you force me to participate, I am seen by all others. And to that extent, my participation enhances my own image in my own eyes that, oh, teacher remembered to ask me. Whether I was willing or prepared or not is a different question, but teacher remembered me. That I am not a neglected entity in the teacher's mind. So this is very, very important because this is particularly important when our class sizes are large, as Madam was telling me, 100 students in a class. Now, 100 students in a class, how do you handle the interaction? Forget interaction, how do you handle the pace of the course? You know, I was advised as a, as a teacher that you should set the pace to the average of the class. Now, this is a common sense approach because there will be some people who are fast learners, fast thinkers, there will be some slow, etc. 
But I was very uncomfortable, so I drew the following graph. It's a very, very interesting, interesting graph. On one side is the ability to do hard work. On the other side is the grasp or speed with which people can understand and appreciate things. You will agree that each individual will vary in the abilities. So typically you will find a whole lot of people in, in this range, okay? And there will be a lot of people in this range. There will be very few people in this range, and there will be very few people in this range. You know, there's a very interesting reason for this. This has to do with the human optimization process. So if I'm a student who can solve things faster, then I know that I am sharper than others, my grasp is very high. I will tend to do less work than others. So I don't need to. You know, I can score marks, etc. With, with just that extra bit of time that I get in quickly solving. My grasp is slow, which in conventional terms means I am a duffer. Then I know that I will have to work harder. I will naturally put larger amount of work. So actually these terms like duffer or intelligent is a misnomer as I told you. I mean my, give me my example of learning a foreign language at the age of three years. I have not yet found a counter example to it. I have not yet found a counter example. So the fact remains that everybody can solve any complex problems except that I am dubbed as a duffer because I got only 47% marks or 50% marks or something somewhere and or I am not scoring marks in quizzes where my other people are. They are all 10 minute quizzes. Nobody has ever told my teacher that when I go to real life and solve real life problems, no real life long term technology problem is required to be solved in 10 minutes or 3 hours. It is solved in two years, three years. So I have ample time, if I have. Anyway, but this is the graph. So I drew this graph and I said the students will be scattered, scattered across this graph. And my ambition, obviously, is to take every student from origin towards the other end. You will agree that this should be the ambition. Increase the ability to grasp of everybody so that people grasp faster and increase the ability of work, working harder for everyone. Take people in this part. Unfortunately, when I translated this uh, hidayat given to me that uh, you should address, you know, Fatak, you should be a pace of the course, you should address to the average of the class. So I do a spatial average, you know, on this graph. The average, let's say, comes somewhere here. Then I took this graph to my colleague professor and showed him and I said, sir, I beg your pardon, but it appears to me that by addressing to the average of the class, I am actually addressing zero students. There is nobody at that place. So I am neither addressing him, nor addressing her, nor addressing her, nor addressing him, nobody. So I don't somehow feel that it is fair that I am addressing nobody in my class. After all, I am supposed to teach my students. So he says, yes, you are right. But then he says, how do you solve this problem? So we actually thought. Then he came up by stating that, that while the pace of the course should be adjusted to the average of the class such that largest number of people benefit maximally. However, there is no substitute for interacting with every student some or the other. And typically the people who need to be challenged most by us, what I have found in large classes are people in this region and people in this region. And they need to be handled differently. People in this region who are low in grasping need extra classes or extra tutorials. So for example, in my large course, whether it is a postgraduate course in modern information systems now or the undergraduate first course in programming, we would have special tutorials on Saturdays. And these special tutorials will be of two parts. One will be special tutorials for the people who are so-called laggards. You can easily find them when they get low marks in quizzes or tests. You know that they need some better. So you give them extra examples, you give them extra explanation, so that you bring them on par in terms of understanding. To these people, you need to give them exercises which will challenge their mind further. They are the ones who, will, who may become complacent. Because they are already performing well, they are probably the toppers of the class, and they have adjusted their life to the optimized level where they have to work this much and get a first position, second position, third position or something like that. 
but leaving them unchallenged will mean that they will not be able to produce to the best of their ability. So the interaction mechanism should be used to ensure that you interact with them. So there will be a, a, a curious one and a half hour tutorial with these, this, this group on Saturday and there will be half an hour or one hour tutorial with this group. And both are compulsory. They must come and attend. And here they will be given problems which they cannot solve. This is another uh, thing which I have emphasized all throughout my life, having learned this from another professor of mine, a great uh, late uh, professor uh, uh, Mukherjee of electrical engineering department. He, he actually gave a problem in his field scores which nobody could solve. So the students came to me. Uh, unlike what she said, I was actually an electrical engineering graduate and am taking electrical engineering. But those days it was not even computer science, but specialized in something. And I could not solve that problem, so that student and I both went to like Professor K.C. Mukherjee and showed him that paper. He says, sir, we can't figure out this answer. So he had a large laugh. He says, so you can't make out. Huh? Then he asked him, sir, what is this solution? He says, I don't know. And he asked him, sir, I beg your pardon. So he says, look, this is part of an unsolved research problem for last eight years. But this batch was so good, I thought somebody will solve this problem. Now, in most circumstances, uh, students will take a morcha to vice chancellor saying outside the syllabus course question asked in the exam. But this student of mine went back to his hostel H4, collected all his batchmates and they had a milkshake party that evening celebrating what the great professor Mukherjee thought that that batch was capable of solving an unsolved research problem. So they had a milkshake party. You know that is the honor and respect that is given to solving unsolved problems. So this is another theory, not theory, I would say uh, a conjecture that I have formed. It's called Fatak's conjecture. Again, I have not uh, found a counter to this. This conjecture says something like this. Solving 10 simple problems successfully will give you a lot of joy, but no significant addition to knowledge. Attempting to solve 10 very difficult problems, not getting anyone at all successfully, will give you a lot of frustration, but great increase in your knowledge. This is the Fatax conjecture. If anybody finds a counter proof, I shall be very glad to have that. I have not found one. And I keep struggling. I keep struggling to find it. Okay. Our conventional examination system does not permit us to do such kind of experiment. But what prevents us from doing this experiment interactively with students, if not with all, at least with chosen students at this end, so do that interaction with the chosen students here and simply put up those questions on the notice board for all others who are interested in solving. I remember in one place, in a small place, I think Mansoor, uh, was it Mansoor or some college in Rajasthan, uh, they, there was a group of students encouraged by two faculty members who, who have formed a club of solving difficult problems. So somebody will pose a problem then the people will solve it, then they will submit their solution, then they will have a discussion around that. Okay. It has nothing to do with syllabus and nothing to do with the domain also. Problem could be in any domain. It's a wonderful idea. Now this requires merely some interaction. Now the point is for that interaction, we as teachers should be proactively leading the effort. To expect students to take the lead is not very easy. Same thing if you take, for example, tutorials. Setting up tutorial problems is not easy at all. Okay. Setting up tutorial problems which will force students to think is still more difficult. So I would suggest set up graded problems. Graded problems means graded in difficulty. So a little easy problems which will simply indicate the application of simple knowledge that they have gained in the class, then something else which will apply, ask them to apply their mind and so on, increasing in, in complexity of the Take assignments. We rarely give assignments. If and when we give assignments, the assignments are often mass copied and submitted because we rarely get time to correct those assignments. Now that's a problem because correcting 100 assignments, 100 different assignments is not very easy. Here again, we do not punish plagiarism correctly and sufficiently. In our courses, for example, we often announce that if an assignment, take-home assignment is given, 
and if it is found to be copied, an F grade will be awarded in the course immediately. There is no question of your following that course further. In spite of this warning, every year I am required to fail at least one or two students even in IIT just on this count. I feel very bad about it, but I fail them because there is no choice. Do we take such harsh measures on copying? We don't. We claim that copying is increasing, people are increasing copying. Copying is like tuition. Students want to maximize their gains. If they can't understand something easily, they will go and take tuition or they will go and attend coaching classes. Similarly, if they have to submit some assignment and they have no time, they will copy. They will not copy if the punishment is too harsh. Okay. It's like purchasing ticket for railway journey. If the punishment is 10 rupees, fine. You know, there is also an insurance agency, I'm told in Dombili, at least 20 years ago, it used to be like that, that uh, people are encouraged not to purchase railway passes, but to get the passes from this insurance agency at half the price. If they are caught, they are supposed to pay the fine, and the fine will be reimbursed by that company. The wonderful thing, without doing anything, we are actually making money statistic. So there are people, okay, who will, who will pay only if they are caught, not otherwise. Now, if the punishment for getting caught is so harsh that it acts as a deterrent for not doing something, then it will work. So these are something that you have to decide on your own. But this is an excellent opportunity, assignment, particularly group assignments and group projects. I had once uh, some, uh, 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 some students in Goa University had gone on strike and uh, the strike had just ended and those students met me. I was involved in setting up their MCA program. So I had gone there and I was talking to them, why are you doing that? He said, sir, classes are not conducted, teachers are not appointed. So I said, uh, so, so you went on strike, three days strike. So, so you lost three days. Now before those three days, how much efforts had you taken? So what do you mean, how much effort had you taken? So did you work 24 hours? Did you study books on your own? Did you study, so try to solve problems of your own? I said, does the vice chancellor come in your way if you want to work in the evenings? You take your laboratories. How many of our laboratories work 24 hours? Practically none. Why? Because there is a rule book which says you must have a staff member in the lab. I have gone for one year to set up the computer science department in my alma mater at GSIT. I said, I was also told that you cannot keep the lab open till there is a staff member there. I said, is a fancy rule? My labs are always open here. You know the rule that we follow here? If a single student wants to work for 10 minutes at night, 2 o'clock, then he or she should be able to work. If he or she cannot work, then there is something wrong with our system. We change our system. So I tried some experiment. I said, students will manage the lab. No, how something is stolen from the lab, who will be responsible? As if the staff member uh, being present does not result in uh, stealing of the things or something like that. Whatever. So I appointed two staff members on what you call contingency grants, daily wages. And because they were on daily wages, they were willing to come on Saturday, Sunday because they will get wages there also. And I appointed them in shift duty. Not during office hours at all. Only after office hours end, their duty will start. Their instructions, open the lab and keep sitting there. And don't interfere with whatever students do. And students run the lab. Okay, they run it perfectly well. I understand even today some of the labs in Indore are run like that, but not all. What prevents us from doing this kind of experiment to increase interaction? But this requires that I should make myself physically present during at least some of the evenings and some of the nights. It is difficult because you will not find many mad Fatak's or Isaac's or something like that. But it is possible to create this composite madness if the group of faculty members in a department agree. So we actually took turns. Somebody will come on Monday night, somebody will come on Tuesday night, somebody will come on Wednesday night, till the practice in, was inculcated by students. And what a great opportunity of interaction, you know, when you talk to the students in the night, you know, no pressure of timetable, this, that, that, you are relaxed. So much happens during that interaction. It is possible to increase the use of our existing laboratories enormously by incorporating final year students to manage the labs. We don't believe in them. We suspect that there will be some hunky-punky something will happen. 
But if at all we can believe in other staff members, there is no reason why we can't believe in students. We have to take the responsibility. So I would suggest that this interaction effectively means that I will have to actually increase the interaction by some innovative methods. And I must stop cribbing about the system. System rules, regulations will always be there. We blame many times private management of engineering colleges. Uh, it is well known that the purpose of many of the private managements is actually to run the education as a business, which is contrary to expectations from the educational sector, but that's it. We cannot forget that because of that, the country has created 2,000 engineering colleges where some very well-deserving students are getting admission to engineering program which otherwise they would not have gone. So to that extent, this situation has helped. But I do not know of any management, private or public, which comes in the way of a teacher. If a teacher says, I will come on Saturday, Sunday, or I will come in the evening and engage students, if students are interested. So while we cite the rules, let us not cite, overdo the citing of the rules to say that they come in the way. I don't think they come in the way. Our own initiative or lack of it might come in the way. So my suggestion is, please increase the interaction through lectures, through tutorials, through assignments and group projects, through these special sessions, as I said, special courses. It is not uncommon in IIT that when a new course is born, it is typically born by a previous offering as a non-credit course. My own course in uh, Modern Information System for non-CA students came out as a Saturday course, non-credit course. 50 students took that course from various disciplines. We ran this course for one semester. No degree, no certificate, no nothing. But at the end of that semester, I could make a proposal for an elective course, which is now one of the popular electives in the institute. So such initiatives will help us also, and will help students also. And you can try your own innovations. The other problem is, even if such innovations are tried, we fail to A, circulate such innovation amongst the entire teaching community. For example, what he is doing in his college is not known to her, what she is doing in her college, and so on. That is one reason why we believe that interaction through web and through projects such as Ekravya could be useful, where we, you know, interact with each other also to find out what innovative things are happening. Maybe some of us will be encouraged to take that interaction to the next higher level. Finally, our project is an extraordinary opportunity to interact. Unfortunately, there are so many final year projects. You take 100 students. I mean, take my field of computer science typically. 100 students, first of all, there is no notion of an individual doing a project. 100 projects cannot be handled by any call. It's a group project. So typically, three, four, five students will form a group. Still, there are 25 projects. Are there 25 faculty members in computer science department in any college? No. There are probably two and a half, or three, or four, or five. And they are inundated with the load. As a result, there is very little interaction that is happening. The innovation that can be tried is to involve industry. Get industry professionals to work as professional co-guides for the projects. You will get sponsorship for the projects. You will get somebody to participate in that. Some of your load will be shared. But projects are the best opportunity to really advance the knowledge of you individually as teachers or the students of the institution. At uh, Valchan College in Solapur, when I was born, their mechanical engineering laboratories were constructed through final year projects of mechanical engineering students in batch after batch after batch. So batches were given projects, you know, construct this experiment, that is your final year project. Money was put in by the institution, but all the design and fabrication and everything was done by the student. In three years, they have a fantastic lab there. We can, we can do such innovation thing. Now, this innovation cannot come without interaction. And this interaction is something much, which goes much beyond your course or uh, class kind of interaction. In this interaction, I will say there are some fundamentals. I am not claiming that these are all the fundamentals because as I said at the beginning, most of the fundamentals have been addressed at two levels. One, you would have discovered them as teachers yourselves. You know exactly what are the possibilities and what are the limitations. Two, in this very course, 
I think various teachers who have interacted with you, various colleagues who have interacted with you, would have indicated a variety of ways of interaction. I don't know that Professor Gadre had a chance to speak to them, where he had taken students, some 90 students, and given them, you know, a, a, a seminar assignment. So they had to prepare, and then they had to give a seminar. Okay. They are forced to make a presentation. And then after that first presentation, in the course projects, by the way, each course project in my course or any courses, Processions course on database or Processor IS course or network, if there is a course project, the evaluation comprises of the submission as well as the presentation by them. And that presentation is quizzed by everybody else. And it's a, actually a phenomenal experience because all other students want to prove that this project is not good. So the kind of question they ask, we can't even imagine sometimes. So it's a beautiful experience, but we have to spend a lot of time in doing that. Okay. So apart from all the things that you would have already discovered or you would have already interacted with uh, my other colleagues and found out, I thought I would just mention a, a few things which I consider as, as very fundamental. In any fundamentals, I will say, on interaction. First of all, the objective must be clear. This is a subtle point, but I would like to make it nevertheless. Many times in our interaction with students, including in our lectures, we are tempted to show off how much we know. This is natural, because we already know so much. But I think the fundamental objective of a teacher is not to show off one's own knowledge, but to encourage others to increase their knowledge. Now this is a theme, it's a, it's a very, very difficult ball game, you know. Because when the temptation to show up arises, it is not a constant thing. It will arise momentarily. So when, when, when I ask a question to a student, am I asking the question to make that student think? Or am I asking the question to the class? Because I know nobody knows the answer, so that I can later on show off the answer. The very, it's exactly like the temptation as some of you who do consulting, for example, would know in, in one of the seminars here which uh, uh, I was asked to coordinate chair the on fundraising. People were asking about increasing consultancy and uh, sponsored research and so on. And on the consultancy projects, I had said the following from my own experience and the experience of others. It is possible to do a whole lot of consultancy projects and a whole lot of academics, but there are two possible ways of looking at the interaction. One, I can do a whole lot of consultancy such that I get very real life critical problems to help my academics, is one way. The other is, I can gear my entire academics such that I get more and more consultancy projects. You understand the subtle difference between the two. And there is a very thin line dividing the two. And no amount of rules, regulations, etc. can safeguard that you are on the right side of the thin line. It is a perpetual exercise in self-discipline. I have been doing it, many of my colleagues have been doing it. You must not accept any assignment unless it adds meaningfully to your academics. Either a new research problem or some sponsored problem or some hard problem, unless you are getting it. Okay. It is, so now this is a thin line. In exactly like the same way, this is also a thin line. Because by the very nature of our profession, we are required to show off our knowledge. Without showing it off, how will we pass it on to people, you know? The purpose behind that showing off should not be to show off. The purpose is to make others increase their knowledge. So if you can consider this to be a, a fundamental aspect, that I must guard against this. And this is not a one-time guard. This has to be a perpetual guard because in our life, you know, with these variations, that moment really will occur. These are the things that we call temptation. When you say people copy, you know, they are not habitual thieves. They are copying because they are tempted to copy, because the indigestion is lax or something like that. Okay. So this is one. The second, when students misbehave, okay, we catch them, sometimes we have to punish them, whatever. But the fundamental aspect in our interaction with student must be compassion. 
I call it forget and forgive. The biggest mistake in our interaction that we can make is that we have punished the student for copy, given him a fail grade, and we remember it perpetually for the rest of that student's life. That he was given a fail grade because he copied. He is a chore, he is a thief. We help branding him or her as a thief for the rest of his or her life. And last but not the least, Addressing the individual. I was asked by one colleague, you know, uh, used to be very heavy coursework and things like that. So he, I was told that in a class of 100, you know that only five or six people will do something extraordinary. So why are you making everybody's life miserable? Why are you chewing up everybody? Why are you giving so much exercise? And I said, yes, you are right. Only five or six people will do something extraordinary, but I don't know which five. So I have to assume that each one of the hundred is capable of doing something extraordinary. And I believe that while those five or six will do something extraordinary, not because of me, but perhaps in spite of me, perhaps others may be helped to achieve something extraordinary. So that is why addressing every individual and finding out the individuals for this kind of uh, very specific interaction. Because you know the students that we get have amazing talent. It is most often dormant because we see their talent only through our exam and interaction uh, through the uh, official work. But you would see some other talent like in music or like in debating or like in drama during other events. And you will say, oh my God, I never believed this fellow could do something such, such a fantastic. I, as I mentioned about the uh, tech fest and the mood indigo, I have got another specimen to show you. This. Uh, may be able to see this briefly. It says the dream team. TechFest has been a technical festival that we have been conducting for a long time. In 1998, meaning this team started working in 1997, that was the time when I was working on setting up the school of IT. One of the ambitions was to increase the entrepreneurship spirit. Uh, TechFest, by the way, is not a small team like this. TechFest is organized by something like 250 students. But this small team came up with my colleague, Professor Chandorkar, who is here. This is yours truly, and there are other students. The idea was to create some kind of a business plan competition that only IIMs and other institutions used to have it till then. But there's a difference, the business plan around development of a new technology or product. So business plan around technology innovation. And this program was called Eureka. This Eureka was set up by this dream team. I very proudly carry this photograph with me. The amount of time I and Professor Chandorkar have spent with these kids in the late nights is enormous. Planning, uh, thinking of writing to various people, collecting things, collecting judges, awarding, uh, identifying. This was the kernel of our business incubation activity which later on came to fruition in the School of IT first and today we have the Society for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Of course, a lot more, more people have worked on creating that sign structure and it is considered one of the best incubators in the world today, not only the best in the country, but the seeds of that great thing were in this dream team. All these students, of course, have passed out I mean, 1998, so almost nine years. They are all at various places. But they all fondly remember that interaction. And what I am pointing out is not just interaction for the sake of itself. To the institute itself, it has created such enormous thing of great value. While we might have taken it further and others might have worked, but the kernel was in the enormous work that these kids did. Such is the power of interaction, friends. There is no, there is nothing that we cannot do with this. I would only like to submit in conclusion that the interaction with students should not be considered either as a supplement or as an addendum to the educational process. I think interaction should be considered central to the educational process itself. Why we have to state this emphatically is that given the situation on ground, Again, I come back to 100 students in a class. I mean, where is the time to interact? 
my first course i attended in management of research and uh, development one professor anand from iim had conducted that extraordinary professor he spent a considerable amount of time in memorizing the names of each individual attending there were about 25 teachers some young some old were attending that and i used to wonder how this man addresses each individual person by name and i realized that i feel very nice when he says father do you have something to say or better do you have something to say or somebody who has something why i felt nice is because i felt being individually addressed when i approached him in one of the evenings he said sir uh, you have a fantastic memory you can remember everybody's name then he says uh, professor fatak my memory is as good as anybody else's but i spent two days in memorizing the names so in many schools of management you will find that attendees in a in a uh, ex executive development program will have their name batches why because the the speaker generally addresses every individual by name we have not developed that strategy so what happens you know for us every student becomes part of a statistics and statistics as we all know is a great science but it never applies to any individual it applies only to the group so my strongest i i try to do that by the way but i i failed miserably in uh, i used to mug up these uh, 300 names in the class every year i succeeded in remembering some names but then i started calling fellows by wrong names and so on so i stopped doing that uh, it can be perfected it may take some time my colleague late professor shankar used to do that he would remember every student whom he has ever taught by his roll number name and also marks that he scored and when he would come here after 10 years with his wife and some kids proudly showing them iit Uh, Professor uh, Shankar will actually greet him by calling him by name. He will feel very elated. He will introduce his wife. Unfortunately, while passing, Shankar said, "By the way, you scored only 53 marks in my course, which was, I think, completely unnecessary." <laughs> that was showing off. You know, showing off that I can remember. Anyway, jokes apart, I think it is an extremely good idea to remember this: that addressing the individual should be part and parcel of our educational process. and no matter how big is the class all that it means is that we cannot constantly address every individual but if during the year or during the semester which is a semester long course in three months and i have whatever 30 40 lectures if in 40 lectures madam if i have failed to address every individual at least once then i would think that there is something lacking in my effort only thing is while you must do it consciously it must appear to be spontaneous then only there is a value you can't say you know because it will number ah your name something like that no not that. it's like yeah, I, i remember from my gsit days there was a great professor of mathematics whose lectures used to be very drab very drab very uninteresting and uh, one day he came to the class and he started writing a theorem then he suddenly stopped and looked at us He says, "Now I will tell you a joke." So that itself was a joke. So everybody became attentive. So he says, "A cow has four legs. A table has four legs. Therefore, cow is a table." Now we will prove this theorem. <laughs> so we just could not figure out. Then we understood that the joke was over, and we were wondering why the hell? I mean, this great professor of math. Why did he think of doing that? In, in some other later context, while participating in a intercollegiate drama com and debate competition. Another professor, Kyle of English, who was telling him, "Sir, this funny thing happened. We couldn't figure out." Then he started laughing. He said, "Oh, the professor had come to me asking me why students are not interested in his classes. So we told him that he should perhaps try telling them some jokes, and that is how this has happened. <laughs> so jokes told mechanically or interaction done in a very mechanical fashion is not an interaction." It is the lesson that we learned. I mean, I, the, the professor. See, some of us. This again tries to tell you, I, whatever I might try, I may not fundamentally become a different person than what I am. That is my limitation. That I should try to use my own strength by learning from whatever strengths I can. And this again, you know, should re-emphasize what I said earlier. No teacher would ever like to be called a bad teacher. No teacher goes to a class with that intention. Every teacher wants to put the best foot forward. 
Some students may like some teachers because of the flamboyant nature of their work. But let me tell you, students will always respect hard work, always respect genuine ethics, and always respect compassion, no matter what you are. And these things do not require great technical strengths or oratory skills. These things come from heart. As long as you can get them out and to the students, you have won the battle. Thank you so much. I think I will stop here at this stage.